Ladies and gentlemen, allow me, if you will, to paint a picture. The year is 1995. Jordan has just returned to the Bulls. OJ was found not guilty. And Major League Baseball's player strike ends. I, a boy of 12, took my first solo trip across country to visit my brother in Toronto, Ontario. Days later, I was shaking hands with future Hall of Fame quarterback Troy Aikman. Meanwhile, down in Jersey, a young John Hansen has turned his hard copy fantasy football newsletter into fantasyguru.com. However, that is not the beginning. Where are my manners? My name is Josh Smokey Hell Nelson, and this is The Smoke Show. I would appreciate if you hit subscribe on whichever of the fine platforms you're listening to this on, whether Spotify, YouTube, or truenorthffb.com, home of the A-Team. This podcast is also, appropriately, presented as part of the Fantasy Points Media Group. The Fantasy Points Media Group is home to the in-your-face, like, 97 Mace lineup of shows that include the True North Fantasy Football Podcast, Dynasty Happy Hour, Play to Win, Dynasty Vipers, Injury Prone Podcast, newest edition campus to canton and of course the fantasy points podcast follow the team on twitter at fantasy pts live and watch out for the weekend review threads that drop every friday so you don't miss a single thing you can follow us at the underscore smoke underscore show and myself at tnff underscore smoky without further ado i must say how humbled i am to welcome on to the smoke show the head of fantasypoints.com host of Sirius XM's Fantasy Football Morning and chief fantasy analyst for Fantasy Zone on Direct TV the man they call guru Mr. John Hansen thank you for your patience on the introduction how's the day treating you I'm doing well Josh that was uh, very professional I like your presentation there I got a little NPR thing going on there but like <laughs> not nerdy you know, <laughs> so I'm digging it, though. I do have a question. Uh, what are we smoking here uh, on the show? Is it <laughs> what, is, what is the representation? Is it uh, literal? Is it figurative? Is it ganja? What are we doing over here? There, there's a lot of different connotations you could roll with it. The original iteration of the show did have a uh, nice pun, by the uh, way. Nice pun. You can roll with it. Get it? Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, up in Canada here, uh, it's been legal for a couple of years, so it's uh, a comfortable subject, we can say now. Gotcha. Um, but it, it did have some connotations, but there was a lot of double entendres, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. With the, There's yeah. just a lot of low-hanging fruit that you could sure. use for uh, various yeah. promotional. Talk about John Smokey Brown, you know. Yes, like sir. Love Smokey. <laughs> Yes, but, uh, you know, as I alluded to in the intro, 95 was not the beginning. So I would like to go back a year further into 1994. Being a formative turning point type of year for you, what was the inspiration behind the Guru Report? How did you land on publishing a hard copy fantasy football newsletter? Yeah, it's a very uh, basic and, and simple story. I've told it a million times, happy to tell it again. But I was in my mid-20s. I was married with, with a kid. And, um, you know, obviously needed to make money and, and a living. And I had a, just graduated recently, maybe a couple of years earlier uh, with a degree in, in communications, you know, BS degree, let's be honest here. It's like majoring in watching television, but um, <laughs> the only way I was going to end up going to college, which I did uh, finish and got a four-year degree. And I, I am really into media. So I was working at, as a disc jockey in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And, um, played fantasy football uh, for a while. I started uh, in the 80s, believe it or not. Uh, my first pick was actually Walter Payton. Okay, so I am, okay? Now, in my defense, I was like 18, but still uh, pretty wow. damn old. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I was pretty good at fantasy, and there was a guy in my league who I, I made a couple like incredibly ballsy picks. And the guy's like, you're like the guru or something, you know, like, and then they kind of started calling me that. So I was working at this radio station and they started renting space in the building to a little over the air TV station that had literally like four viewers. And then there was a change in the FCC regulations in which all of a sudden this little rinky dink over the air station was in like a million and a half homes. And they had to, the cable companies had to carry them. So 
it's a long story, but they, they started putting on these little cheesy local like call in shows and sports shows, a couple sports shows. All right. So I'm sitting there in my disc jockey booth and there's a guy doing like a sports show and it was just him and it was terrible. And it was right around the, it was fantasy draft season. I was like, dude, not for nothing, but you should probably have me on your show. And like, they call me the guru in my league, you know? I mean, you know, even in 94, people were pretty, pretty tuned in uh, to fantasy. So he, he did that. I came on uh, once or twice. We, we really hit it off. And then I just started doing the show full time. We started gaining a little bit of a, a cult following because at the time there were only like 30 channels. That's it. You know, so if you were on one of the 30 and we were a couple nights a week, once uh, a week right before the Monday night kickoff, you know, you start getting a little bit of a following. The next year I, I kind of proclaimed Isaac Bruce as the next uh, Jerry Rice. And people were like, who the hell's Isaac Bruce? Like literally, like they didn't know who he was. And I was like, that's a bold statement. And well, he ended up having the fourth most receiving yards in the history of football. Um, so right around that time, I uh, decided because we were getting a lot of calls. I'm like, you know, I'm looking for, I'm looking to make a move here, do something, get started with something in, in media, ideally. So I decided, oh, let me just start a little hard copy newsletter. I was working in publishing and I could just like market it on the show. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, if I get 400 subscribers, you know, at 30 bucks a pop, you know, a little extra spending money and things like that. And pretty much that's, that's the start of it all. Slapped up that web page there in 95. Um, tried to get involved in as many things as I could, like um, contacting magazines and the like, and, you know, writing articles and expert polls and expert leagues, even when they started in the late 90s. Um, and then in 96, I got um, contacted by ESPN, which was a shock. I didn't know it was ESPN at the time. It was like a different company. <laughs> It was this guy from the Starwave Corporation. He's like, um, hey, send me your stuff. Maybe we could use you. I'm like, who's this guy think he is? Like, a, I thought he was a potential subscriber. I'm like, oh, sure, I'll send him my <laughs> And then a couple of days later, I'm on ESPN's website. Back then it was called ESPN Net Sports Zone or something. And I just happened to see at the bottom, it said like powered by Starwave Corporation. I'm like, wow, what is up with that? And turns out that was company owned by Paul Allen, which I'm sure you know up there in Canada in Vancouver. Yeah, that's right, my um, neck of the woods. Yeah, so it turns out Paul Allen had a company called Starwave Corporation that ran ESPN.com. Then I found out what they were looking for because they had literally no fantasy contributors at all in 95. So then I started bothering the guy in 96. They brought me on, and I was like technically the first fantasy football columnist on ESPN, and I did that for seven years, and it just kind of took off from there. Unbelievable. So what, what was your analytical process like in those early days and how has that evolved to the present? It's a great question. Um, I've always been a little bit more of a qualitative guy. Um, I'm an eyeball guy. Um, I'm kind of like, um, I'm not a, I'm not a big numbers guy, but what's really ironic about that is, you know, I work with Graham Barfield and, and Scott Barrett. I work on the radio with Mike Clay, who's a really good friend of mine. He's a great guy. And um, our processes are so much different, yet we always come to the same damn conclusions on, on players. Because, you know, I guess when your eyeballs have been peeping out players for 27 damn years, you, you better be pretty good at, at, you know, scouting and things like that. And um, I've just always been someone who – had a uh, pretty good emotional intelligence, like very good intuition. I could mm -hmm. read people really well. I would, I was very predictive oriented. I would make like these bold predictions, you know, like uh, Walter Mongdale's going to get his ass kicked. You know what I mean? Like, even though that was an easy call in uh, 1984, <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that really hasn't changed all mu that much. What, what has changed is obviously I've kind of honed in, honed my my eyeballs, if you will, um, learning a little bit more about what to look for and, you know, what are the attributes and all that. I certainly have a, a feeling for the data and all that. And like I said, I always seemingly come up with the same answers than the data people. Then the other element of it is um, just general NFL news and reporting, being able to parse through the, the BS, the coach speak, things like that. 
you know, that's just something that, you know, I did have a degree in communications, which was kind of in that realm, but not exactly like I never took like a journal journalism class or anything, but that's just one of those things you kind of learn as you go. But Josh, at the end of the day, I was a 25 year old dude looking to make money and get my own niche. And I was really into fantasy. And um, from the moment I started till like an hour ago, I've been just kind of flying by the seat of my pants and uh, <laughs> figuring it out as I go along. So how important has the guru branding been from this get-go? Like the, the, when you walk into a place preceded by that, it kind of sets the bar pretty high. Yeah, it does. It, it brings, uh, does draw a lot of skepticism. Uh, you know, it's a funny story about, about that. I was at the Super Bowl about, uh, it was a year I was in Houston. Um, I can't even remember who the hell was playing. It was, wasn't that long ago. It was like three years ago. It was in Houston. So a friend of mine that I work with on TV, uh, his name's Dr. Mark Addix. He was on ESPN for a while. He's a big, uh, you know, medical analyst, but he also played in the NFL, won a Super Bowl. So he lives in Houston. So with all the NFL people there, he had like a little dinner party. So I go to the dinner party and I'm a little late and I know a lot of people in the room, but there's a couple of, but I didn't know. So, uh, Teddy Bruschi's there. And you watch ESPN, you see Teddy Bruschi. I mean, you know the guy's no no joke, right? He, <laughs> he, he doesn't smile much, you know, like he's it's very serious, you know, football. <laughs> um, obviously fit in well with the Mr. Belichick over there. So anyway, so I'm I'm sitting down and I think it was like Mark Schlereth or something. He's like, Teddy, I want to introduce you to someone. It's the guru. And and Teddy's like, what? like I was like, I'm sorry, Teddy. I apologize. It's <laughs> it's I was like, it's marketing. Um but yeah, some people do. I mean, the, you should have seen the eye roll. He's like, who the hell is this guy? But then obviously I, 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 I cleared the air. I'm like, it's just a name, you know? And then we, we talked and he was like, oh, okay, this guy's all right. But it was initially, he was like, really dude, really? <laughs> You're going with that? But um, it's funny you mentioned that because you know, when I started it, I was just going to go like my name, but I'm like, you know what? This damn guru thing, like, I didn't give it to myself. I mean, it wasn't like people were screaming at me down the street back then. Yo, guru, you know, but they did call me that in my league. Um, people do kind of gravitate toward it. I think a lot of people honestly kind of want to be led, you know, in, in, in life in some ways and things in, in fantasy. I'm like, well, who better to lead me than a guru? But at the end of the day, you've got to back up everything you're putting out there about yourself. And I, I did do that um very well early on I, I a lot of people you know would tell me and I, I kind of agree like in those early days of the fantasy industry like i was just kind of ahead of everybody so i would like destroy everybody and then like 10 years in people are like oh hansen you lost your edge i'm like whoa 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 it's just it's not me i'm the same guy it's just everybody else is smarter yeah you've seen the kind of curve of the industry catching up to what you were kind of leading on you know and it all honestly it almost all goes back to that Walter Payton pick. And, and it's, uh, I actually forgot about this for decades, but my first pick ever in this league. And granted, I was like invited by my Babe Ruth baseball coach in like with an hour notice. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't know the NFL, but I, I didn't even know what, I was literally introduced to the concept of fantasy football. And then 75 minutes later, I was drafting. That's You're on the clock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I did lead the league in points. Um, and now I forgot my damn point where I was going with that. But, uh, you know, I did back it up pretty well um, by doing the opposite of that Walter Payton pick. So I was so mad at myself for taking Walter Payton. Granted, he had like 370 carries or touches the year before, but he fell off a cliff. I was like, well, that's it. Uh, overcorrection. I'm only taking young, ascending, exciting players. I'm never taking anyone to tell of their career ever again. And <laughs> I kind of been like that. A couple of years later, the best story is back then in '89, mm -hmm. uh, in my league, people just you just didn't draft the rookies until like the fourth round, even if you knew they were great. Like I remember, even a couple of years after that, Marshall Falk was a fourth round pick. Everyone knew he was great. Still fourth round. I took Barry Sanders at 10 overall. And then Ooh. on the hook there, 
I, I had a satellite dish where I would scout players out with getting raw feeds just from the sky. Basically, it was no direct TV. <laughs> I saw this Sterling Sharp guy balling out for the Packers. I'm like, oh, my God, this guy's unbelievable. So the next year, his second year, I think he had 55 catches for like 700 yards and like three touchdowns. I took him at 12. And he had like 1,400 yards and like 14 touchdowns. That's when the guy's like, you're like the, you're like the guru or something. But it kind of all went back to that first Walter Payton pick and the shame and humiliation I felt for taking an old man who was about ready to <laughs> be shown the door. But what a story, man. That was just beautiful. Your first pick ever being a whole favorite, Walter Payton. Uh, it's fantastic, but uh, it's it's interesting how the it kind of corrects itself that way. When I first started out in fantasy, which was not quite as long ago as you, uh, I learned very hard the first year that you do not draft with your heart, you draft with your head. And uh, going hard on my Dallas Cowboys back in 08 or 09, whatever it was, uh, it didn't serve me too well in the end. Did I think you, I did you take uh, Chad Hutchinson with your first pick? Oh, probably something like that. It was just, yeah. it, it wasn't Carter? good. Oh, that was Aikman, right? Was he still Oh, there? no, then, oh, wait, no, Aikman was done. No, he was uh, gone then, okay. Uh, that was a Romo years there. Oh, oh, wait, dude. see, I'm thinking, of, oh, my God, I'm thinking of 98. Never mind. No, see, no, you no. See what happens? <laughs> you start following up the decades here, you'll, you'll, you know, forget about forgetting years, the confusing years. This guy right here, <laughs> I confuse decades, sir. It's interesting. Well, you have the advantage of a very first-hand perspective over one of the largest samples of an industry. And you, you've seen trends arise and become integrated into fantasy football in order to evolve and improve the game. With this in mind, what do you see as being some of the next steps in the evolution? You know, that's a, a really difficult question because I think the key to the progress, and believe it or not, the innovation is actually simplicity. Because I think like DFS, it's so basic. I used to get companies come to me all the time. I've got this great new idea where I'm going to simulate the stock market and you can buy and sell these guys. Uh, I was quoted once in the Wall Street Journal for this. It was a big launch. This company had a lot of money behind them and 20 years ago. And they were going to do this. And I'm like, they asked my opinion. I'm like, yeah, it's not going to work. And they're like, why? <laughs> I'm like, it's too complicated. Nobody's got time to really dig deep in the weeds there. So maybe some sort of hybrid situation where you, you get multiple facets of fantasy sports linked together, like uh, player props and DFS and season long. I, I don't know the answer to the question, honestly. I don't. I don't really think anyone does, but I, I do believe that the key will be simplicity mm -hmm. to whatever changes we see. I mean, I think the, the core component is just ease of use and simplicity. I mean, people are just, we love fantasy. They love it, but I don't know if they love it enough to where I'm going to take a course on how to play. You know what I mean? Spend 15 hours and learning how all this works. And that's the thing I really kind of loved about fantasyguru.com is you guys just made it so digestible and just the the the, the plethora of talent that you had on there. Uh, it was just, it was great. Like that's how I first learned about Joe Dolan and man, he, he's been one of my favorites ever since. Um, yep. So kind of what we're talking about that, leaving behind fantasyguru.com and starting fantasypoints.com. Take me through that uh, decision and process. Like, how did it feel starting from scratch, but this time with the added advantage of your position in an industry that you helped birth? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for 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 lack of a better way of saying it, um, I, I got to a point after like, you know, 20 some odd years, and I, I did try my best to bring in guys like Joe Dolan and uh, Tom Brawley to, to take up you know, some of the, the weight of it all, it, it was just too difficult to do. Um, it's, it's hard enough to be all over the content and also do media, but I was literally doing everything for a number of years, like even behind the scenes, you know, customer service for God's sakes, I did for 
for 10 years. I would work wow. for 12 hours doing business development type things and customer service type things because it's part of it's my fault. I should have delegated a little bit more, but it was one of those things where uh, it's going to take me two hours to explain it. So let me just do it in an hour myself, you know, yeah. but um, yeah, it, it was, it was just too much. And, you know, a company came and, and, and approached me and I've had many other companies come and approach me in the past where I, you know, kind of fended them off a little bit, but you know, they, they looked at my books and, and it made like an offer. And I was like, nah. And <laughs> I was like, that's it. I was like, nah, I was like, thanks for your time, but no. And then they came back and upped it like a decent percentage. I was like, well, you know, now I really got to start thinking about all the time that I've taken away from my family over the last 20 years and all the sacrifices I, I made, you know, like I, pretty much didn't go outside in my thirties, Josh. Uh, you know, I went to a dermatologist recently. It's like, oh, you have the skin of a, a man 10 years younger than you are. I was like, that's because I didn't go outside. For like <laughs> two years. He's like, that'll do it. Um, so yeah, that, that was a decision that it was a very difficult one and all that, but um, I, I made it and um, you know, my quality of life did improve after that. Um, and then uh, now with the new thing, Obviously, the difference is that I brought in all of the guys and I said, look, guys, you know, I respect you all. I know you're all hard workers and I know ultimately you're you're you guys have what it takes to help. I'll help you basically get this puppy off the, the ground, you know, for, let's say, a half a decade. And then, you know, at some point I got to like walk off into the sunset and you guys are going to be well equipped so i basically gave them all an ownership ownership percentage and just gave it to them and uh right out of my own pocket basically and uh so they're already paid back damn near half of it already so i mean it's year 15 months in could it could have probably paid it off you know in a month or two um so yeah so it's a lot different now that ben Kukanis who of course you know love uh, Beth. Joe and Tom and Graham and see these guys are doing business development things I'm not touching the customer all the things that drove me nuts like I'm not doing anymore so I'm just trying to you know focus on the football and the broadcasting and I mean I'm involved but it's not like it was literally every single thing that would come up with fantasy guru the website you know and for 20 years it was pretty active site there were a lot of you know tech problems and customer service needs and things literally every single thing that came up content wise or behind the scenes it was on me now it's way different so that's why I'm kind of back uh with the new site so that had to weigh fairly heavily on you how how does how is that affected your mental state now with being able to delegate those responsibilities in a way that would have been a lot help more helpful back then how, how does that affected you i mean i, I definitely um i feel less overwhelmed because that that was the the word i would use for 10 to 15 years unmanageable like and again i tried to bring in help but it would be like i would bring in two full-time people and then we'd grow 19 percent and i'd get a, another media job that would take me away and and things like that so um it's just it's just manageable now basically as opposed to completely unmanageable but i actually thought you were going to go back to the guru site and and how i kind of handle that because the website is obviously still going on mm -hmm. obviously without me and the surprising answer is i don't give a shit you know, I thought it was going to really bother me, but I think I've been so energized by the launch of Fantasy Points and kind of doing it all over again, starting from scratch. It's kind of like Tom Brady, you know? I mean, not to put myself in that same air. Uh, he's got much better hair, but um, it's kind of like that, you know? Like, it doesn't bother me at all. People have asked me, I've been asked a hundred times, doesn't that bother you? Like, you're no longer, I'm like, not really. Uh, I'm I'm into like doing it again, basically. And um, as I said, when we launched the site, this is one last 
chase of uh, perfection in the fantasy sports industry. Mm -hmm. And that's got to be a great feeling knowing that you've hit that home run twice. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, right now it's like a right now with fantasy points, it's only 15 months in. So, it's, I mean, it's a ground rule double right now, but yeah, certainly um, looking, looking at uh, we're looking to steal third and probably uh, go home on a, on, a, on a wild throw to third, you know. So, yeah, yeah, it feels good. Yeah, it does. Though the route may have been unconventional as you navigated the waters and forged the path of a fledgling industry in the mid 90s is is this where we're talking about is this where you envision being at this point in your career like was this the goal having a household name presence across multiple media mediums like you said you had the bachelor's degree in communications so i imagine this sort of scenario had to have been at least one of the outcomes yeah yeah i mean i I don't really think of myself as a household name kind of a thing. It's just, I don't know, I guess, I mean, obviously I'm a little too close to uh, myself, but um, you know, the other whole element at play here, um, which I've mentioned a, a, a number of times, but it, it, it kind of is like, it kind of like was part of the reason I, things were unmanageable. And, but it's also a big element that gives me great, great satisfaction. So I, planned on being in broadcasting and my wife and I uh, had a, a child very young, like 23 and 24. Um, that kid now is like 60. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but um, I uh, kind of had to like almost give up on like uh, the dream of being in broadcasting because I'm like, wow, I got to make money here. And my, my wife was still finishing her school. So I'm like, I don't know if I could really pay my dues making $7 an hour at a radio station or $12 an hour at a TV station moved to like Wyoming. So I'm like, well, I guess, uh, I guess I'll have to find another plan here. And you know, the whole broadcasting thing is really not going to work out. Um, then I did the fantasy and at the end of the day, fantasy sports gave me a backdoor into a broadcasting career. So I mean, that to me is one of the, the best parts of all this, because when I was 12 years old, that was my dream to be in broadcasting in sports. And I'm, I'm starting this year, my 18th season on Sirius XM covering Jeez. the league, of course, 18 years. And then wow. this year, the eighth season on uh, direct TV, I did seven seasons of a TV show on Comcast. They didn't promote it very well, but it was called Fantasy Fix and a assortment of other things. So that that is the most rewarding thing of all this for me is uh, I've been able to kind of marry the two, the broadcasting and the fantasy. Yeah, you're kind of like the EGOT uh, winner of the fantasy world. You, you've kind of touched on all the different performing aspects and everything. I know that's a, that's a lofty, lofty thing, but you know what? I'm crowning, I'm crowning it right here, right now. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's just like uh, they used to ask me like, like maybe whatever, seven or eight years ago, like, why don't you go to the FSTA? I'm like, well, I mean, that's for people who are there to do business, right? I'm like, my website grows 12% 20 years in a row. I have at the time a national print magazine I had a national radio show on Sirius. Um, I did, I had a newspaper column that was in like, you know, the Chicago Sun-Times. Um, other things uh tv i'm like i kind of don't need to go there because i'm too busy as it is <laughs> no doubt no doubt yeah I, I don't think you ever have a worry about uh, what to do with your free time at all if it ever in fact exists <laughs> no, a, lot of that, a lot of that let's be honest it was because i was one of the you know early adopters if you will uh you know the longevity it really means a lot. And I'll say to you, Josh, and I'll say to people watching this now, just keep putting yourself out there, whether it be anything on the internet, YouTube, your own pod, other pods. The one thing I've learned over almost damn near 30 years is you never ever know who's watching or who's listening. So at the end of the day, even if no one of note is, if you do it long enough, you'll you, people will start like, oh yeah, yeah, Josh Smokey, yeah, 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 I know that guy, you know, kind of a thing. That's kind of what I did. Like my wife, I used to drive my wife nuts because we'd be getting ready to go out uh, in the fall, like 
you know, out to dinner real quick on a, Saturday, a Friday night, you know, it's like eight o'clock and I'm like finally breaking away. And I'm like, you know what? I'll be right. I'm going to do this radio spot in Nashville in eight minutes and I'll be right there. And, you know, I would do that just over and over and over again. She's like, why are you doing all this? And then like 20 years later, I'm like, yeah, well, that's why, you know, it took decades to, and like I said, I don't even think I'm like this huge name that like everyone's heard of. Maybe they have, I don't even know, but I put in the time for decades to put myself out there. So I would just say that to you and anybody else watching, just, just keep doing what you do, put yourself out there. You'll get better in terms of broadcasting and your analysis and you never know who's watching or listening. It could be, you know, business for you or a job down the road. No, absolutely. I mean, case in point, my podcast itself, I had just work. I had just finished reworking eight months through tearing this thing down to the studs, reworking it to what this format is now, which is, you know, providing multiple perspectives on various things within the fantasy world and getting to know your analysts a bit more as actual humans and not just number crunchers on a screen in front of you. Um, but I, I was basically just finished doing the redesign, like I said, and I had my first uh, feature interview booked with Adam Rank. And that's when uh, Travis from True North uh, approached me saying, uh, Ben Kikanis was asking about your your podcast. I'm like, the one that doesn't have an episode out yet? Like I, I, had, I had scrapped all the old episodes that were out because I did the original iteration of this back in uh, May of 2020. And uh, it, it was more of a, a generic format, but it was, I had fake commercials for products that didn't exist. I, I brought a bit more levity to it. I, I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a clown, a joker. I like to have fun. I like people to have fun. Hey, that's my thing too, man. I once refused. They, um, I did that TV show for Comcast Sportsnet. One year they said, you, you must wear a tie. And I said, have a nice life, fellas. Not a tie. <laughs> and I got my way on that one, but they probably came me the next year, but I didn't care because they wanted me to wear a tie. But sorry to cut you off there. But yeah. No, no. That's, that's, that's a good interjection. I like that. But uh, speaking to your point, you never know who's who's watching. I mean, I thought the concept was, was cool because, I mean, for the episodes that have the micro interviews. So, like, there's ones that have the feature interview like this. And then there's other ones that are kind of clip shows. So, interviewing a bunch of people on the same question. Kind of like street style reporting in, like, five to ten minute micro interviews. We put all those together and it gives you multiple perspectives for some questions that might be kind of lingering on fantasy players minds yeah i think it's um, cool i mean i like the interview style you know yeah it's just it's a conversation i mean you, you look at the greats out there guys like rich eyes and everything it, it's a conversation you're, you're you're listening you're listening to what's coming through and if 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 you're not kind of responding to that and you're just you know reading off a form okay you, you're done that one you, you got to make it engaging you got to make it entertaining getting you know the right guest on like yourself uh, makes it quite easy on me as a host. Um, yeah, and you never know who, you know, keep asking the movers and the shakers on the podcast and you're increasing your network, your networking right there. You know, th what's funny is I'm not a schmoozer at all. Like I just can't kiss anyone's ass. <laughs> so people are like, you know, everyone, I mean, you must be like real schmooze. I'm like, ah, not really. I just have been around so damn long uh, that it's eventually you'll, you'll come into my orbit, you know. Uh, but I'm sure you're a better schmoozer than I am. Uh, well, in, a, in the former career, I was a bartender and a hospitality worker for about 20 plus years. And uh, there you go. That's, that's where I learned to be engaging with people, that how to read people, stuff that is, you know, very translatable to other areas in life. And I've, I found it suited me quite well. Interviewing is just like talking to a, a customer on the other side of the bar there. Yeah. Do you read players like that, by the way? <sighs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get more up on that. Uh, there, there's I do. Different areas. I, I, I do. I have, uh, I've done that from the beginning, honestly. Uh, Kaplan, Adam Kaplan broke my balls about this for a decade plus about my like body language tip offs. Then all of a sudden he noticed that NFL teams are really starting to pay attention to body language and, in, in like combine interviews and, and even once they're in the building and things like it's now it's like a thing. And I was like, uh huh, you see it's intangibles. Uh, it is. I'll give you a great example. Um, 
six years ago, I'm at the combine. And what happens is when I'm there, they Sirius XM NFL radio, they bring a lot of the players once they are available on the set there, but they have like spillover. Like they can't get every damn player on the NFL radio. So I would take like the cast offs, you know, like, like Dak Prescott, when he, his rookie year, your boy, yep, nobody round. wanted to talk to him. Fourth round pick. I'm like, I'll talk to him. You know? So I did that, but there was a receiver who, I mean, I feel like, I'm, you know, a pretty friendly guy. I can make, these these kids feel comfortable you know and uh, i'm pretty good at that and so i tried it with this guy and he was just like mumbling looking down at the ground no icon i'm like screw this guy this guy's got no chance well Devonte parker his first five years was ben it was ding 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 nailed it <laughs> and he had one damn good year you know but that that was a great example I'm, i said i'm like forget this guy They're like why I'm like, eh, I, I'm just, I'm just not seeing a, the, the opposite of an alpha dog. Whatever an alpha dog is, that guy's the opposite. Oh, uh, absolutely, and, it's, and especially when it comes to the wide receiver position, you want these guys to have the swagger. You want them to be that Michael Irvin walking in, like this is my field, this is my turf. I go up and make that play. Y'all clap. Totally, totally. You know, he's like that. Savon Diggs. A lot of energy with that dude. Yeah. I mean, Larry Fitzgerald, not like that, but he's Larry Fitzgerald. I mean, he's, you know. Oh, he's a legend and a saint. <laughs> exactly. One of the most beloved human beings on the planet. Oh, absolutely. Anyone who wouldn't jump in front of a bus for that guy has never seen him or heard of him or even cursory glanced by him because he is just, yeah, he he's just a good human, man. We need more people like Larry Fitzgerald in this world. Yeah. No but uh, switching gears up a little bit, Matthew Stafford. Got some glowing endorsements from you in your 2021 draft plan on fantasypoints.com. Something I completely agree with. Uh, the recent terrible injury to Cam Akers will have a great effect on this Rams offense. You also mentioned in the draft plan that if Akers were to go down, Henderson is a top 15 back. Oh, yeah, so, I did. So is this development a hindrance or a help to Stafford's fantasy outlook in 2021? It's a great question. I honestly have to lean. Um, what did I say? Top fifteen? Well, I, I'm pretty close. I, uh, yeah, I just threw that arbitrarily, but I, I do have him at RB nineteen, by the way. So that's that's close. Yeah. Um, it could be could uh, could could leapfrog a guy or two. But the, by the way, they 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 do have concerns about his ability to handle like a really heavy workload. So they're going to manage him. Uh, right. So I don't think he's going to get a ton of touches. I think our our projected numbers is pretty darn good here. But at the end of the day. Um, I still think it's a, a real nice environment overall for Stafford with this offense. A lot of play action, uh, myriad receivers. I mean, they just they're loaded. Uh, the offensive line, it, it's a little scary when your your best player is essentially a, a forty year old mountain. Uh, Andrew Whitworth will be forty in December, but you know I've always been obviously enamored with Stafford's arm talent. He is athletic. He has a much more, you know, the two things he does that Jared Goff doesn't really do is, you know, he's got a cannon to throw the ball down the field really well. Goff's got a decent arm downfield, but he needs like, you know, pristine protection and it's got to be programmed. You know, he's a programmed quarterback, you know, who doesn't do much on improv. You know, yeah. it's like Sean McVay is like, Jared, run this play, you know, in his helmet. And he's like, okay. Whereas Stafford, I think, is just uh, just a much better uh, cerebral approach, more athleticism, more overall talent, more moxie, better leadership, uh, you name it. Um, reunited with his boy Clayton Kershaw there in L.A. as well. Um, we're going to learn a lot about Sean McVay this year. If the mm -hmm. offense doesn't really deliver, then we may need to look at McVay as – you know, maybe we were overrating him three years ago, but I think the marriage between Stafford and his scheme with their personnel is really, really good. And, you know, the Cam Akers injury is a buzzkill, but I'm still all in on Stafford. I, I think he'll he'll probably throw, you know, in well well over 30. I think he's going to throw over th well over 30, you know, 33, yeah, 36, 37. 37. What's that? Oh, I was saying about 36, 37, you think? Yeah, I, th I think I think I 
you know, I try to be a little, uh, you know, conservative and not project out like the best case scenario. Mm-hmm. I have with 33 passing and five rushing, you know, 35 is nothing to sneeze at. I'm sure there will be dudes out of nowhere who, who better that, but not knowing the results in 2021, 35 tutties is pretty damn good. Absolutely. We're, we're, we're bound to see some league-wide regression on that with, you know, full off seasons for these defenses to get up to speed and everything, not like the uh, kind of offense fest we saw at the beginning of last year. Um, do you think this kind of helps out some more of the ancillary pieces in the receiving game, uh, guys like Van Jefferson? Yeah, perhaps. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what their role is for the other guys. I think I think what you're looking at is Cooper Cup and Woods are their top two guys, of course. Jefferson would be the three. And then you rotate in rotational deep threats, you know, Deshaun um, and then the uh, the rookie. Uh, and then, of course, where does Tyler Higby fit in? Do they go with the 12 personnel? They do have a lot of tight ends. So they're probably going to mix and match things. So probably just a, a little bit, but not sure that this is going to make Van Jefferson even, even draftable. I think he'll probably still need an injury. Uh, to really be impactful because I, I will probably see a, a fair amount of 12 personnel with all the tight ends here on the roster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, I'm i all in on Stafford this year. I think he's got easy top 10 potential. Uh, and, you know, with uh, going to a, a passing, uh, a nice pass-friendly offense with some actual receiving options, uh, I'm to the moon with uh, Robert Woods as well. I think he's just going to absolutely smash and, yeah, I'm excited to see it. Um, He's so you know, steady, Robert Woods. He is. And you know what? You can just plug him in for like wide receiver 14 every year. But I think, injury willing, that he can ascend. Uh, I'm not going to put him top 10, but I think he can finish a little higher than 14. You know, maybe just right on the back end of wide receiver one territory. That's what we have him. We have him at 12. thing about no. Woods is when you do the projections, you, you got to give him at least, it's not a lot, but it adds up. You got to give him at least 125 rushing yards and one touchdown, at least. Because yep. he's had at least that in each of the last three years. So, he, you know, he's a sneaky guy to add a little bit to the totals with his legs. So do you think they keep using him on some jet sweeps and stuff like that, though they've got a quarterback that can actually launch the ball now? Yeah, I mean, that's a you know, fair point, but I would I would think so. Um, he's he's very effective, you know, in that role. He's just a, a heck of a football player. I actually used to like him in Buffalo, believe it or not. Yeah. You know, people forget how good he was at USC, you know? Yes, sir. Well, you know what? Let's end this on a fun note. What are a few of your best and worst calls of all time in fantasy football? Oh, boy. Well, I'll go right to the worst one. Um, I calculated that I literally screwed over a million people with this one because (laughs) it was in the early days. It was uh, not that early. It was like 05. And, you know, one of my pet peeves with the the fantasy industry is a lot of groupthink, you know, and that's why I don't really I try not to read other people because I don't want my own, you know, opinions kind of influence. But I just had this thing with Kevin Jones, the running back out of Virginia Tech. He looked good the, the, the year before. He was he ran a really good 40, very fast, um, versatile and all that. So I, I just got into my head that I was a little ahead of the curve too because I thought it was going to be like a true three down back, catch like 50 balls, get 250 carries as well. So I was talking PPR. I'm like, you know what? I, I like this kid. I interviewed him. That year for the magazine, he was solid. I think he's a Philly guy where, where, where I'm from originally or whereabouts. Ranked him at five overall. Now, his ADP was like 15. So I come out in the magazine and everywhere else ranking him at five. And it just seemed like everyone else was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and there goes the ADP up, 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 up. <laughs> And then, wouldn't you know it, he, he freaking settled in with an ADP of like seven or eight. And everybody who took him that year got absolutely hosed. Uh, it wasn't good. And that was my bad. Of course, the next year, he was a NRB1 in PPR, technically. Uh, but that was Mike Martz who took over. Um, that was that was easily the worst one. Um, you know, I've had, uh, you know, plenty of uh, other ones. 
nothing really truly stands out. Although uh, I did almost quit in 01 because really? Trent Green was my guy. I was all in on Trent Ooh. Green when he went over to the Chiefs and he just completely crapped the bed that year. Of course, he made five Pro Bowls after this, but it was a rough year. 9-11 happened that year. The year before in 2000, I was like, I literally got everything right. Like, yeah. It was unbelievable. It, it was just the planets aligned, the stars aligned. It's like all my quarterbacks. And then I got cocky the next year. I'm like, ah, I'll be fine. You know, and it, he wasn't, <laughs> you know. Uh. So, yeah. yeah. Best pick of all time is probably that Sterling Sharp pick. Yeah. I mean, 10th overall, I'll call up the numbers, uh, was clearly me trying to be the smartest uh, person in the room. Uh, but, you know, in that one instance, I actually was uh, <laughs> some of the results. Um, all right. So we had, oh, this is crazy. 1988, he had 55 catches for 791 yards and one touchdown. I took his ass at 11 the next year. And he had 90 catches, led the NFL for 1,400-plus yards and 12 touchdowns. Just Ooh. that's, that's – that's you'll never I'll never duplicate that ever. That's that was like that was my best pick ever. I'll never I'll never match it. Oh, you've definitely been ahead of the curve on a few more than a few things uh throughout the course of this conversation today. And by the way, I ended up becoming friends with Sterling Sharp. I, I, was, know on she NFL, I was on the NFL network the year it launched doing yep. TV, a TV show with Sterling. Me and Kaplan were the fantasy experts. And uh, it was Solomon Wilcox and Sterling Sharp and somebody else. So um, I told Sterling the show. He's like, yeah, right. He didn't believe me. <laughs> he did not, did not believe me. I'm like, all right, all right. I actually re recently had Sterling on the show after like a 15-year uh, no communication. But, you know, you may remember him, but he's the best receiver that no one ever talks about. He's he's probably my favorite receiver of all time. All time. Yeah, I would I would take him over Jerry Rice uh, regularly. Woo. And uh well, his last year in the NFL, he led the league in touchdowns with 18, then retired. Because he had about uh, going out on top, but that's probably, you know, a lot of these guys just don't know when to hang it up, don't know when to quit. Some go well, out. He was all injury. No, he was all injury. He had a neck injury. No. That that was going to, you know, you know, in 1992, he led the NFL with 108 catches, led the NFL in yards and touchdowns. Mm. And this is with Jerry Rice in the league. The next yep. year, he led the NFL again in catches, uh, 1274 and 11 tutties. The next year, 94, led the, the catches, led the league with 18 touchdowns. And then at 29 years old, he had to retire. He would have played, like his brother Stur uh, Shannon, yep. he would have played at a high level probably another eight to nine years and, and locked, locked in Hall of Famer, locked in. You imagine those numbers. Then you know, with Brett Favre, too, mm -hmm. the 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 prime of Brett Favre's life. I mean, Brett Favre broke out in Green Bay throwing at Sterling Sharp. Yep, and just think he would have might have walked away with more than one ring out of Green Bay in that time. Totally, it's a hey, that's sad. I I, uh, I kind of want to uh, lobby people, and I already have for Sterling Sharp to make the Hall of Fame. By the way, the other story was, I believe I told you the Isaac Bruce story. That was technically my first prediction. Yeah. And that that's probably my second best one. Um, but I kind of tried to help Isaac get into Hall of Fame. He came on the radio show like two years in a row where he didn't make it. And I allowed him to complain. And I'm like, Isaac, we you got to get fantasy people voting. Yes. You know? Power of the people. We really need to have a voice because like, Let's face it. We have moved the NFL needle big time over the last 20 years. Um, uh, Absolutely. And he was like, yeah, well, you fancy people. If you were all voting, I'd be in, you know, five years ago. I'm like, you're damn right. But then the next year he got in. So he came on. It was all good. Oh, maybe it was just that handsome bump. Uh, just getting him over the finish line there. <laughs> next is boy, Tory Holt, who I work with uh, as a co-host for two years. We got to get him in. He'll, he'll be in there as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think he's going to be waiting a ton of time. Well, you know what? I got to thank you so much for coming out today. It's been an absolute honor having you on the smoke show. Um, this, is a, this is a bit of a bucket list item for me. Uh, I actually, it was sometime, 
sometime during the season last year, you put a tweet out saying that, you know what, I, I'm open for some time. I'll yeah, come on yeah. some podcasts, but you, you had to, though, my only stipulation is you had to have been around for a year. And so immediately I went to see when the first smoke show episode was released and I set an alarm on my phone for book John Hansen for the one year anniversary on that. And go. I told Ben Kakanis the story when he, when he onboarded me with uh, the fantasy points media group. And I just thought, <laughs> I just thought it was kind of funny. I told him that and he's like, yeah, we could probably make that happen a little sooner. So yeah. Thank well, you. I, I, I do honestly, appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, you know, sorry if we were a little all over the map there, uh, Josh, yeah. but um, you know, I would love to do these type of podcasts regularly. I really do not have the time, but last year, this year, future years, I, I honestly do it to try and give back a little bit, you know, in the industry and, and help guys out like yourself here in any way I can. But that that's really, you know, my motivation. Well, you maybe not because you're the fantasy points media group, but anybody else, <laughs> that, that's kind of my motivation to kind of like pay it forward just a little bit. No, and you, you, I don't know if we could ever convey the appreciation that uh, I'm sure I speak for the rest of the guys in the media group uh, that, that we feel for the company bringing us on and, you know, having us be affiliates and uh, the, the bumps that we've had. And it's, it's been really fantastic. So thank you. Well, thank Ben Kukanis. Well. That was all, that's all his idea, man. You know, well, I got to say, Ben, you're the smartest guy in the room today, buddy. <laughs> I, I think I am, though, because I'm the one who hired him. You did bring him on, so that that's an executive win in your books there as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So. Right on. Well, my viewers, thank you so much for staying with us uh, throughout this episode. I, I've had an absolute blast. Uh, please subscribe so you don't miss another episode or interview uh, in the future because we're we're just we're having so many fun, interesting perspectives on, and I would hate for you to miss out on that. This has been brought to you by the TNFF Network, home to other such podcasts as the Gold Jacket Podcast, the Point After Podcast, and the Jet Sweep Show, my uh, Monday night football halftime show that I co-host with uh, Will Harris at It's Harris Time on Twitter. This podcast has also been a presentation of the Fantasy Points Media Group. My name is Josh Smokey Hell Nelson, and I thank you for joining us. John, all I have left to say is, where there's smoke, there's fire like Antonio Gibson. Oh, throw some oh, prediction yeah. in there as well. Oh, I love it. And you know what? I'll co-sign on that. Gibby's going north. He's getting that passing game involvement. I'm here in uh, out of camp. So that's the next step, kids. Thank you for joining us tonight.